I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Exodus. And uh, Exodus means the way out. How many have some things you'd like to get out of today? <laughs> Exodus chapter 14, verse 19. Once again, Exodus is the exit out of uh, Egyptian bondage, the exit out in which the children of Israel went forth to the wilderness and then made their journey toward the promised land. And I'm so glad that I made my exit out through the blood of the Lamb. I'm glad that I've made my Passover. Jesus Christ is my Passover. And I'm glad that I'm on my way out of here. Amen. On my way to a bigger, better, more incredible place. And until then, I'm just going to enjoy heaven here and the blessings of God here and enjoy the goodness of the Lord and God's protection right here. Amen. Have you found your places? Exodus chapter 14, verse 19. I love this verse of scripture. The children of Israel are there at the Red Sea. It looks like they have nowhere to go. Pharaoh's coming after them. And it says, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. We'll draw your attention to the phrase, the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. I want to use for a subject tonight, the pillar of the cloud. You may be seated. The children of Israel have made their way to the Red Sea. Moses has taken them out of the grip of Pharaoh and they're trying to get across and they come to the Red Sea and, and it looks like there's no way that they can get across. Pharaoh is coming. He's very angry. He's coming to slaughter the children of Israel to, to take that which he doesn't kill back into bondage, back into Egypt. And they said to Moses, the children of Israel said to Moses, were there not graves in Egypt? We could have died there. Why would we die here at the shore of the Red Sea? And the Bible says Moses cried unto the Lord. And the Lord said, stand still and watch and see the salvation of the Lord. When he said, when God said to Moses, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, the Bible says that a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night went with the children of Israel as they made their ascent out of Egypt. And in the daytime, when the sun was burning hot in the, in the wilderness, uh, God protected the children of Israel, protected the older ones, the ch children, the women, all the children, made sure that they didn't get um, heat stroke in the heat of the day. Now, the, the wilderness that they were going across was uh, very hot in the daytime and very cold in the nighttime because there was nothing there, very few clouds in the sky, and because of that, the heat would just go right up through the atmosphere, and, and the nights were cold and the days were hot because of the beating sun. And so God follows them, and, and he puts above their head a cloud by day to shadow them, to give them comfort as they're making their march out of Egypt. And at night, he would cause that cloud to uh, ignite and begin to blaze with fire, and it would be a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. As they approach the Red Sea, Pharaoh decides that he is going to go back and capture them and take them back to Egypt, and that which he doesn't kill, he takes back into slavery. The children of Israel are very discontent and very fearful because it looks like that there is no way to escape the hand of Pharaoh. But, and Moses cried unto the Lord, and God says to Moses, this day you'll see the Egyptians no more. This day will be the day in which I will put away your enemy and you will see the salvation of the Lord. At that moment, the cloud that overshadowed them began to, no doubt, begin to make a turn and begin to whirl back in behind them. And that cloud by day and that pillar of fire by night rested behind them. The scripture says the cloud 
went from before their face and went in behind them and stood between them and Pharaoh. Here they are nestled at the Red Sea and the cloud is behind them and standing between them and Pharaoh's army that's coming. God says to the children of Israel, go forward. And there's the sea in front of them. And says to Moses, the rod Moses, stretch it forth toward the sea. When Moses stretched the rod over the sea, the Bible says that God sent a wind. And the wind that night blew all night long, and as it blew all night long, it began to wall up the sea. The, the, the psalmist said that it gelled like jello. It gelled, the sea gelled. And he made a, a wall on both sides. How's that for making a wall? He made a wall on both sides, and over a million Israelis marched across, the Bible says, on dry ground. But while he's making this miracle sidewalk through the ocean, he has got that, that burning fire that's warming the children of Israel and giving them light they could see all night long. And the cloud behind them was covering a dark blanket of hideous cloud where the Egyptians couldn't even see to move. Darkness had enveloped Pharaoh and the armies. But the children of Israel was in bright, shiny sunshine because of the burning pillar of fire by night. Now, I want you to understand that the cloud, the pillar of cloud, the Bible says, and that's what I'm talking about. We're not talking about a pillar that, you know, goes up in the Colosseum that's a round thing, that little old pillar coming out. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a wall cloud. How many ever seen a wall cloud? The cloud's so high in the atmosphere and it just comes straight down to the ground. That's the kind of cloud that God brought between Pharaoh and the children of Israel. It was a great wall cloud. And on the side of Israel was the fire blazing and the light igniting. And on the side of Pharaoh was the darkness, gross darkness, that they, could, they were paralyzed. And the children of Israel marched across. I want you to know that Satan right now is paralyzed by the blood of Jesus Christ and we're marching across. Are you listening to me? Right now, the cross of Calvary has muzzled and stopped the powers of the enemy, and we, under the protection of God, if we'll stay in the right place and go forward and listen to God, he cannot, the devil cannot touch us. And so I want to talk to you about this pillar of fire, or, or by actually this pillar of a cloud, this pillar of cloud. And I want you to understand that there is a great, message in this and, I, and I'm going to stop a few places and I'm going to bring up some things that I believe will help you understand uh, even salvation's plan in this. I want, to, I want to begin by saying that as the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel stood between like, like the cloud came and stood between Pharaoh and the children of Israel. I want you to understand the cloud represents three things, and I want to point those three things out tonight. First of all, the cloud is the visible evidence of God's presence. Number two, the cloud speaks of divine fellowship. And number three, the cloud guarantees a supply. A supply of plenty. The pillar of the cloud. The psalmist said in Psalm 46, verse 5, and this is the cloud, is a visible evidence of God's presence. God is in the midst of her, speaking of Israel. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Now, I, you know, I used to read that scripture, that right early, and sometimes I wonder, what does he mean by that, that right early? You know, very present help in time of need. What does he mean by that right early? And I want you to understand that God is ahead of us. God has always been ahead of us. You think he's behind you, but God has always been ahead of us. You think, God, what are you waiting on? God, you're so slow. God has always been ahead of us. I can prove that. Did Jesus die before we came or after we came? Jesus died before we were ever born. God promised eternal life to planet Earth, those that would repent of their sin. God promised eternal life before he even made Adam and Eve. So God's always been ahead of us. 
God has always provided everything we ever need. God has always been ahead of us. And, he, and it says that God would be there in the midst of her. And I want you to know that cloud represents the presence of God. And when that cloud through the wilderness, when that cloud moved, the children of Israel were to move. And when that cloud stopped, the children of Israel were to stop. They were not to do anything in the energy of the flesh. They were to move when God moved and they were to stop when God stopped. And I want you to understand, uh, the church world is in a mess because they're trying to move when God is stopped and they're trying to stop when God is moving. We should never do anything of our own accord. We must understand that we can do nothing except Jesus Christ do it in us and through us. And so that when the cloud moved, that means the presence of God was going. I don't know, I, I, you cannot have the presence of God and expect God to follow you around. You must follow God around if you're gonna have the presence of God. So many people think, well, God, come here. God, come here. Come. No, you go where he is. Are you listening to me? So many people want God to bless them, and they pray, God, bless me for this and this. Well, if you would get under his blessing, it would already be blessed. You see, we don't do things and then say, well, God, bless what we're doing. No, we get where God is and do what we're supposed to be doing under the cloud. We should never go and expect the cloud to follow us around. We follow God around. He doesn't follow us around. He is with us. He guides us and he directs us. Amen. Come on now. God protects us. And I'm glad that, that I've got Jesus between me and the devil. I'm glad that I've got Jesus standing between me and the grave. I'm glad that I've got Jesus standing between me and the judgment of God. I'm glad Jesus stands between me. He is the pillar of fire by night and he is the cloud uh, that shades me by day. He, Jesus Christ is the cloud of glory. Amen. Amen, come on now. I'm preaching better than you responded. The house of God, Solomon built the house, the temple of God, Solomon's temple. And if you remember the story, David got all the supplies ready to build the temple. But David wanted to build the temple so badly, Brother Terry, but David was a man of war, and God says, you're not gonna do it. Your son's gonna do it. He's gonna build it. So David got everything ready. How's that for a dad? He gets everything ready for Solomon. And, and I mean, Solomon has it all. And so Solomon builds the temple, and it is a glorious temple. It is an amazing temple. There had never been a temple greater than Solomon's temple. Herod's was wonderful, but nothing like Solomon's temple. It was incredible. And so Solomon is going to dedicate the house of the Lord when it is built. And he brings the, the, the vessels of God in the, that came out of Babylon. He brings those vessels in and he takes them in. But he doesn't take the, the um, showbread and those things. He takes just the holy vessels into the temple. And then he orders the Ark of the Covenant to come and be brought into the temple of God. And the Ark of the Covenant was the presence of God. That's where God was. There was the cloud with the children of Israel in the wilderness. There was the Ark with the children of Israel in the promised land. The Ark was there with them in the promised land. The cloud, the pillar of fire uh, uh, by night and the pillar uh, by day was the presence of God wilderness and I want you to understand that there's the presence of God in the wilderness which is that that cloud and there is and the pillar of fire and then there's the presence of God in the house of the Lord which is the ark of the covenant the presence of God and then there's the presence of God that gets inside of us and now we become the temple of God the temple of the Holy Ghost amen come on and and Solomon built this beautiful temple and he ordered that the Ark of the Covenant to be brought to the temple, uh, the temple. And as the Ark was brought, they stopped ever so often and they offered a sacrifice. The Bible says not a few, but many. More than they could number, they stopped and offered bullocks. Nor, more than they could number, they stopped. They walked a few steps, they sacrificed. They walked a few more steps, they sacrificed. David did that when he brought the Ark of the Covenant back home in, in, in Samuel, in the book of Samuel. David said they went, what was it, six paces or seven paces, and when they went so many paces, they had to, I don't know what paces is, couldn't tell you, but it's, I, I have no idea what, what the, I'm sure you can ask some theologian that knows everything that can tell you exactly how many inches it is, 
but I don't know. And uh, but but it's not very far. I would I would I would suggest five, six paces, seven paces wouldn't be very far. And David offered a bullock. He offered sacrifice. What well, Solomon did similar to the same thing. He brought the Ark of the Covenant. For miles he traveled to bring that Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And when he finally got that Ark of the Covenant there, after offering not a few, more than could be numbered sacrifice, he took that Ark of the Covenant, that presence of God, into the house of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because, the, because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. That's when they brought in the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and the cloud filled the house of God and the ministers had to get out. The Bible says the priest could not stand to minister. That's a picture of your day and my day. It's not anymore the priest that offers sacrifice for you and I. There's no room for, for those that are trying to be uh, uh, take authority over the Christianity. There's no room for but one holy priest of God. His name is Jesus Christ. And they've been forced out. The glory of God has forced out all the priests. And when all the priests were forced out, the glory of God filled the house. Let me share an interesting scripture with you. I think it's in verse 13. Anybody getting anything out of this? Here's an interesting, it talks about a settled place. A settled place. Now, Solomon didn't realize it, but he was prophesying here. He thought that it was his temple, but it wasn't. It was the temple that you and I are, that Jesus would be inside of us. The priests were pushed out because of the glory of God. And, and religion was pushed out because of the glory of God. Phariseeism was pushed out because of the glory of God. And now Jesus Christ lives inside of us and we have become the temple of the Holy Ghost. A settled place, verse 13, 1 Kings chapter eight. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in. A settled place for to abide in for, for thee to abide in forever. Well, that house wasn't a settled place for God to abide in forever, but I am. And Jesus Christ has settled a place for you and I, for God to dwell in. This is a settled place for God to be. God has settled it once and for all. The blood has settled it. God stands between me and the law God stands between me and my failure. God stands between me and the presence of God. The presence of God is there. God's got my back. God's got my front. God's got my right side. God's got my left side. God's got my underneath. God's got me above. God surrounds me with his glory. Cloud, that cloud that protects me in the heat of the day. That fire, a pillar of fire, a cloud that keeps me there in the night he, that God has settled a place for him to live inside of you and I forever amen I love that it, I mean the glory of God came down in that temple so powerful that the priest couldn't even go back in the priest couldn't even go back in and I want you to know when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary he settled the priesthood and he became our everlasting priest and the other priest can't go back in. It's forever settled. Are you listening to me? All right. Number two, the cloud speaks of divine fellowship. The cloud speaks of divine fellowship. Are you listening to me? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse three and four. And did all, he's talking about the children of Israel going across on the, on the dry ground going through the Red Sea, talking about you and I that's been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. And here's what Paul says to Corinth, chapter 10, verse three and four. And did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they that drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was, is Christ. Are you listening to me? 
Says we all eat of the same spiritual meat. We've all drink of the same spiritual drink. We've all followed. That rock has come to be with us. That rock is Christ and has followed us. And I want you to understand, that rock in the wilderness didn't follow them around like a turtle. That rock just showed up everywhere you need him. And I want you to know, no matter where you're at in life, Jesus will be there where you need him. You don't see how he gets there. You don't know how he arrives there. But every time that you and Israel needed a every time they needed a miracle, there that rock was. They didn't see that rock rolling around like a tumbleweed behind them. They didn't see that rock walking around like a turtle falling behind them. That's a weird thought when you think about that, a rock following someone around. But that rock was Christ. What it means was is that God is so sovereign, Jesus is so sovereign that no matter what you face in your life, you're in a problem, Jesus will be there. In the darkness, Jesus will be there. In the trials of life, Jesus will be there. Look around, look around. You say, God's nowhere around. Look around, God is. We all eat of the same spiritual meat. That meat is the power and the manna from above the word of God. We all drink of the same spiritual water. That water comes from the life and the blessing of Jesus Christ. They that believes in him shall never thirst and that we can have inside of us a well springing up into everlasting life as we believe on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a confession to make. Get your pencil out and write this down. It used to always bother me when the Old Testament would mention that God dwelled in the dark cloud. That always troubled me. I prayed about that. I've sought the Lord. Why in the world does it say God has a secret place in the dark cloud? I always think of God wherever the lights are on. I mean, understand what I'm saying. I always think wherever God goes, that's like saying the sun is hid in a dark cloud. The, no, but I want you to understand something. Uh, I'll point this out. Um, God made darkness his secret place. Would you listen to me? God made darkness his secret place. I've got Bible to prove that. Uh, Psalms 18 verse 11 says, He made the darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. Psalm 97 verse two, clouds and darkness are around about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Now, that used to always bother me where it talked about God in a dark cloud. Here the psalmist says that God has a place, secret place where God is in the dark cloud. I want you to understand, this is a great picture of no matter what you're in this world, God has a secret place on planet Earth. This Earth is flooded with darkness. This Earth has darkness everywhere, but God has a secret place. You look at that dark cloud and you say, where in the world's God in that? You look at the sick time in your life, where is God in that? You look at a storm in your life and it looks so hideous, you say, where is God in that? The dark waters and the turning waters, the storm, where is God in that? Where in the world is God in all the darkness? Where in the world is God in the cloud? I want you to know he has a secret place and it takes uh, just the, the breath of God's nostrils to blow away the darkness, that God is there and he'll, he'll look at you through the dark cloud. He'll come to you through the dark moment and he'll lift you up and the fire will begin to burn. That cloud of fire will begin to be uh, present. Listen, understand this. In the Old Testament, when God came in a dark cloud, meaning he was gonna judge, he was gonna bring great judgment. But in the New Testament, you don't see Jesus in a dark cloud. In fact, Matthew chapter 17 says that when Jesus was transfigured before them, Peter, James, and John, that the cloud came and overshadowed him, and the Bible calls it a bright cloud. You'll find in the New Testament, it's not dark cloud anymore, it's bright cloud. Because Jesus comes to bring the bright cloud. Now in the Revelation, in the book of Revelation, you see clouds coming. In fact, the Bible says in the first chapter and verse seven, 
Behold, he cometh with the clouds. And you see the clouds in the, it, it looming at the time of harvest when the angels would come and, and gather the chaff from the wheat and, and, and that forth. And, and I believe there'll be moments when God will return in the dark clouds of judgment. But I want you to understand that we as children of God, we've experienced the bright cloud of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we have the blessing of God. And the cloud means that God is there. Don't worry about how dark it is. Don't worry about how, how loomy or how, how ominous it may look around you. Don't worry. God has a secret place. God is there. God's not away from you. His presence is there. He's with you and he stands with you ready to bless your life. Amen. Come on now. <laughs> did that help you a little bit? I hope it did. Because it just bothered the fire out of me that talked about God in the dark cloud. But I want you to know it comforts me to know. Not only is the cloud the visible evidence of God's presence and the cloud speaks of divine fellowship. Aren't you glad for that fellowship? But the cloud guarantees supply. Clouds guarantee supply meaning the precious rain that brings forth the fruit of the earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we read some of it a while ago. Let's look at verse one and two and three through four. Paul is saying, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud. Are you listening to me? All our fathers were under the cloud. And then it goes on to say, and all passed through the sea. That's the Red Sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now listen to me, Moses didn't stop and have a baptism party when they were crossing the Red Sea. Moses didn't stop and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Moses had millions of people going across. He did not take time to baptize everybody in the Red Sea. Couldn't have done it anyway because the waters were walled up and jailed. So who did, the, who did the baptizing? God did the baptizing. God looked at that Red Sea parted and as they walked across, God saw that as a death. He saw that as putting Egypt behind. He saw that as marching on to a new world. Not only were they baptized in the sea, the scripture says, listen to me, they were baptized in the cloud. So we have the baptism here of being born again, and then we have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, right there. Do you see that? The cloud. Oh my, oh my, look up here. I'm preaching better than you're responding now. My, 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 my. That's good stuff, isn't it? And so they were all baptized under that cloud, all baptized in the sea, and he says, we were all, just like our fathers, were baptized too. Not by some pastor in a baptistry, but by the presence of the cloud of glory and by the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A miracle from God that brought us out of Egypt into a new world. Let's read the rest of this. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, I read that to you earlier, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm drinking from the spiritual rock. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm eating spiritual meat. But I don't understand what the preacher's talking about. This is spiritual meat. You understand a, a drumstick at K Kentucky Fried Chicken better than you do this. Come on now. Woo! Praise the Lord. Don't you just love Wednesday night? Shucking the corn on Wednesday night. But I want you to understand that we eat of spiritual meat. And I'm... And I'm giving you some meat tonight. If you can just grab it and chew on it, manna from above, the bread of heaven, the blessing of God. I, I want you to know, when they were baptized by the Red Sea, taken through Egypt, 
baptized into the person of Christ, a new world, a new life, being born again, and then baptized by the cloud, being baptized in the Holy Ghost, marching on with power and glory, and eating of the meat, the spiritual meat, and drinking of the spiritual water that come from the spiritual rock that follows us around, and that rock is Jesus Christ. Man, that just excites me. Let me point out one more thing. That rock was Christ. Let me point out something in Romans chapter five, verse five. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Now you see a progression here. He says the hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad. Where did we find shedding? The shedding of the blood of the Lamb. When Jesus shed his blood, he was shed in liquid love. He was giving us the very substance and the presence of love. When Jesus bled on that cross, he shed his blood. The Bible says he shed it abroad, meaning the blood of Jesus Christ is for everyone, every boundary, every nationality, every human being. It's shed abroad, not just in our hearts, but in the hearts of other people by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That word shed means Jesus shed his blood. That word shed means to share his love. We need to be out sharing his love with the world. That word abroad means overflowing and running over. God makes our hope not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Look at verse six, Romans chapter five. And when we were yet without strength, when we could not pull ourselves up, when we could not save ourselves, when we could not forgive ourselves, when we could not do anything for ourselves, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse eight, Romans five. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to know the, notice the phrase in verse six of Romans five. When we were yet. When we were yet without strength. Yet without power. Yet without holiness. God died and gave us forgiveness even to the ungodly. Then it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were without strength, Christ died for us, gave his life a ransom for us. When we were without, when we were sinning and in iniquity, Christ came and died for us. I want you to know tonight, I am so blessed to be a child of God. Listen to me, please listen to me. It may look dark, you may see a cloud that's so black and so hideous. You may say, where is God in this? You may say, where is God in this time in my life? Where is God in this time of opposition? Well, he's just tucked away. He's got a secret place. I said, he's got a secret place. And when he comes, he comes to bless his children and he comes to judge those that have rejected his son, those that have rejected Christ. Man, I studied this tonight, and I thought, this is good stuff. I studied that, looking at that, and I thought, boy, I tell you what, there's such an awesome presence of the Spirit of God in that, and that cloud. I want you to understand, see again, God's coming toward you. If you can visualize this, how many ever seen a wall cloud? Pillar, big pillar wall cloud. You ever seen one? They are so ominous. I mean, they are massive. They cover from east to north or or usually they come out of the west to the north and they're huge southwest to the north and they're so huge they they look like they're touching the ground and that they're going so high they look up and it looks like it's like stories high 17 18 stories high 20 30 50 60 stories high and right above it many times the sun shining but that cloud is so ominous. You know what it means? It means you better buckle down. And you better find a nail in this holy place or you're gonna be blown away. 
What it means is that the judgment is coming, the storm is coming. But what it means for a child of God, blessing is coming. You know, I can almost see that wall cloud now. I see it in my mind. And that wall cloud, old Pharaoh looked at it, he couldn't see nothing. It was nighttime, by the way. It was nighttime, he couldn't see nothing. He was paralyzed in darkness. But the children of Israel just watched that old Red Sea bank up. They watched it and the land dried. And they just marched across, lit up. I mean, lit up. That wall cloud so high that Pharaoh can't even see the light on the other side. It's just total blacked out. But on the other side, Pharaoh couldn't move. Pharaoh didn't know where to scratch his nose. It was so dark, Pharaoh couldn't touch his nose. It was so dark, Pharaoh couldn't move. He couldn't give a commandment. It was so dark, they were so paralyzed. But on the other side, <laughs> we on the other side sing amazing grace. We on the other side sing Beulah Land. We on the other side sing power, 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 wonder work, power in the blood of the Lamb. We on the other side No, we are going somewhere because God has baptized us too in the Red Sea and God has baptized us too in the cloud, the pillar of cloud and we can march on and shout and praise God and magnify God. And even after we get out of the clutches of the Pharaoh, even after we get out from under the bondage of the enemy, even though after we get out from the slavery of Egypt, we're out there in the wilderness and the cloud just stays with us. Amen. Can you see? I'm about done, but can you see how many? Oh, there's a million in Israel. Could you see a half a million, a million tents put up across the, the wilderness plain? Could you see in the million, in the wilderness plain, a, 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 a half a million, maybe a million tents put up? And then that great tabernacle is there where God meets with man, the priest and the offering sacrifice. And that cloud's above. And at night it's burning with fire, warming the whole camp, millions of Israels. In the daytime, the cloud's high and overshadowing and making it cool. And the children of Israel saying, I like this spot. There's a little pond here, a little little bit of water here. I, we like this spot. And all of a sudden, the cloud begins to shift. And that cloud begins to whirl. And they blow the trumpets. It's moving time. And the trumpets are blown. And when the trumpets are blown, it's time to pull up stakes, roll up tent, and march on. And the Levites and the priests had the worst job because they had to take down the tabernacle. And then the priests had to get together and carry the Ark of the Covenant in front and they marched on. I bet, you know, I shouldn't say I bet, especially when there's a, uh, especially when there's a state in our union called Nevada. But I, I just say that there's people there in that wilderness that are saying, God, I, I don't want you to move. I just want to stay here where I'm at. God, don't move. It's too much work to move. And we got people in our church kind of like that. I don't want God to move. I like it the way it is. I don't want it to change. But God starts moving and you say, oh man, we never seen it like this before. We're going places I've never been before. Oh man, you mean God's leading the preacher? I doubt it. The preacher says he's hearing from God, but I doubt it. Man, I'm comfortable in my chair. I'm comfortable in this house, and I don't want to be bothered. God, please don't move. I'll have to move. Come on now. I'm hitting pay, I'm hitting pay dirt right now. God, please don't move. It's too uncomfortable to move. What will people think? If God sent really a Holy Ghost revival like some of us pray for, you wouldn't like it because you'd have to work. You'd have to move. Well, that ain't God. 
had someone come to this church one time and they said, are you Pentecostal? I said, we are. But we believe in preaching a good, solid, fundamental message. They said, well, we want to be in a good Pentecostal church. They came out of an assembly, assembly of God. I know I shouldn't name names, but I'm on television. I want everybody to not be in suspense. I want them to know. And, uh, <laughs> and this guy says, I want, it, I want it Pentecostal. And boy, one Sunday night, it come unglued here. I mean, one Sunday night, they was marching up and down. They was shouting glory. People were falling on the floor everywhere. God was moving. It was incredible. And that family calls me up the next morning and says, we ain't coming back. I said, why? Because it ain't, we ain't that Pentecostal. We've been going to that church, and they named the church they've been going to. We ain't never seen nothing like that. That can't be God. Well, you know, I don't want to be cruel, and if they hear me on television, I'm kind of glad you left. We got more seats for people on Sunday morning. <laughs> but like, let me remind you, if you come here Sunday morning, you better get here early to get a good back seat because they fill up the front. They're forced to fill up the front. The back's full. I, never, I got so tickled. Two weeks ago, we had a packed house, and, and they'd filled the back seats. And if you're on the back seat right now, I don't have a problem with you. You can come and sit with me next time, okay? But anyway, uh, they filled up the back seats. I mean, it was packed. And there was one little row of chairs where Josh is. That's it, where Travis and Josh is. That was all that was left. We were full. And this guy comes in and looks around. He's got his family with him. And he, he reluctantly bows his head and walks like this sits in the front. And you could tell his wife did not appreciate being on the front row. <laughs> they left very unhappy. <laughs> so come early so you can get a good back seat. Amen? <laughs> Terry's moved on me. He usually sits over there and he's moved up. I don't know what's got into him. April's finally got her way. Dave slid back one seat. He usually sits in the front. Leave me alone, I know. I will next Sunday. A week from Sunday, I'll leave you alone. Amen. You know, isn't it awful? We bought our tickets to fly to Dallas and then to uh, Tucson, Arizona. And they had a little deal on the internet that says, it costs extra to sit with your wife. Yeah, I had to pay extra to be able to sit beside my wife. I thought about, well, how much does it cost to not have to sit by her? <laughs> she ain't in here. I'd have never said that. <laughs> Stand with me. I don't know what you're going through, but I can tell you this. God is there. You may say, where is God in this? I'm telling you, he's there. God has a secret place. Whatever you're going through, his secret place, he's there. And you need to just recognize God in all your storms and all your trials. Recognize that God has never forsaken you, nor will he ever. Nor will he ever, ever. We've been on YouTube, and, and Josh got the little click. Someone listened to Terry sing in Egypt. We're going to have to teach Terry new language. But it's good that people are listening and they're hearing the word of God. I want to ask you tonight, if this message has moved you, if this message has helped you, I'd like for you to recognize that pillar of cloud. That pillar of cloud that is on your side. We say, well, it's not here. Yes, it is. God's glory is still here. In fact, when Jesus left, he left in a cloud. And when he's coming back, he's coming in a cloud. And the clouds of God's glory are here. And I want to invite you to come. Whatever your need is, if you need us to pray for you, we'll do that. If you need to come forward and just ask strength from the Lord, do that as they play and sing.